Okay, hello everybody and welcome to our first online class. Hope everybody is safe and healthy and not too bored with all this being stuck inside. Um, this is my second time attempting to narrate through this PowerPoint. Uh, I hope I don't have any of the issues I had the first time where uh, the sound was getting cut off at the end of slides. Hopefully you can all hear this fine. This was also originally intended to be kind of a quick review PowerPoint after our speeches on the last regular day of class. Um, obviously it's been a while since then so this should hopefully kind of recap everything and get us all back on the same page. Um, we're going to start today by talking about the underlying causes of the Russian Revolution before in the next lesson moving on to the actual events of the Russian revolutions of 1917 themselves. Okay, Russia in the 19th century, before most of the events that we're going to talk about, was probably best defined by the phrase backwards autocracy. Autocracy being absolute and direct rule by a single person, usually a monarch, which we all know was the case in Russia, which was ruled by the czars, the emperors. This man right here was Tsar Nicholas I. He ruled from 1825 to 1855, and he was in many ways the personification, the perfect example of Russian autocracy at its finest. He was a very ultra-conservative, uh, very uh, repressive Tsar. He didn't really tolerate any dissent, any questioning of his hereditary and divine right to rule over Russia in whatever way he saw fit. Uh, again, very backwards in his policies, not a lot of real progress in terms of industrialization or any sort of reforms during his reign. He was followed by his son Alexander II, who did implement several important reforms, most notably the freeing of all the Russian serfs, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, he was then blown up. Uh, a bunch of people who didn't like the fact that they felt that his policies were not moving, his reforms were not moving forward far enough and fast enough, threw a bomb under his carriage and quite literally blew him up. He was followed then by his son Alexander III, which we learned a little bit about in the speeches. Uh, partially out of fear over what had happened to his father, as well as his own personal tendencies. He had never really gotten along with his father or agreed with his policies. He was a much more conservative and reactionary czar. Uh, he was very much an absolute monarch. In fact, under his reign, Russia had pretty much the most absolutist monarchy left in Europe. Even while uh, Germany and Austria still had pretty absolute monarchies, there had been some reforms there. Um, some increased political participation, particularly after the revolutions of 1848, but that didn't happen in Russia. Under Alexander III, Russia remained very much a autocracy, an absolute monarchy. Alexander III instituted uh, a secret police that watched pretty much everyone. Even teachers and university professors had to send the secret police detailed reports on all of their students letting them know if there was any hint of any sort of revolutionary activity at all. There was very strict censorship, no freedom of the press whatsoever. Um, basically, no real rights, especially political rights, no political participation. Everything started and ended with Alexander III and his ministers at the very top. Um, he also attempted to make all of the various minorities living in the Russian Empire more Russian, if you will. Uh, one way he tried to do that was by forbidding them to speak any of their own languages. So no more uh, Polish, Finnish, Chechen, Ukrainian, Georgian. No minority languages were allowed. Everybody had to learn Russian. He was hoping that would help to unify the empire by making all of these minorities a little more Russian. He also started several pogroms against the Jewish people living in the Russian Empire. Pogroms are, of course, mass and systematic persecution targeting the Jewish people in the empire. Um, Russia really only started to industrialize in the 
later half of the 19th century. Um, started a little bit with Nicholas I, got going a little more with Alexander II, but progress on that was very, very slow. Uh, again, Alexander II didn't free the serfs until 1861, so everything was kind of lagging a little bit behind. Um, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about freeing the serfs and industrialization and its effects on Russian society uh, a few slides from now. Okay, so in 1894, Alexander III died from kidney failure and was followed on the throne by his eldest son, Tsar Nicholas II. Now, Nicholas attempted to continue the autocratic policies of his father with only very limited reforms. Unfortunately, Nicholas really lacked the personality and the force of will needed to rule successfully as an autocrat. He was what you might call a good man, uh, but unfortunately a terrible czar. He was shy, charming, and kind. He was very generous. People really liked him. He really cared about the Russian people. Uh, he was also, unfortunately, fearful and indecisive. He was pretty much the exact opposite of his father in terms of personality. His father had been uh, kind of brutal, decisive, intimidating, uh, both in terms of you know his personality as well as physically. Alexander III had been a, a massive man, like 6'4", like 280 or something like that, a very big dude, whereas Nicholas II was kind of short and, you know, I guess you might even call him scrawny. So complete different people, different personalities, different physical presence. And again, Nicholas didn't really have what it took to rule as a czar. He was also a very devoted family man, which for most people is a wonderful trait to have, but not if you are the Russian czar. He unfortunately would constantly put his family and their needs ahead of the needs of the country. This was most notably the case in terms of his son, the Tsarevich Alexei, who had hemophilia. Hemophilia is a hereditary disease uh, that can be very life-threatening. It prevents blood from clotting at all. Uh, especially if you have the most severe form of it, which Alexei did have. Even the most minor injuries, tiny cuts, uh, a bumpy carriage ride, a uh, fall where you bump your head, can potentially be life-threatening because you start to bleed internally, and that bleeding never really stops. Even today, uh, it's very difficult to treat. It was even more so way back then. Uh, Alexei was one of just the, uh, one of many, many royal descendants of Queen Victoria who developed the disease. Uh, she had probably become a carrier of it through a random mutation inherited from her father. And through her many descendants, she passed it on to the royal families of um, Russia, Hesse Darmstadt, Spain, and a few others. Um, women, although they can have it in rare situations, are usually only carriers, whereas if you're a male, because it's X-linked, if you inherit the defective X chromosome, you are guaranteed to have it, which was the case uh, with Alexei. And again, he had a very severe case of it. He was constantly falling ill. He was a very sickly child. And the Russian royal family actually kept that hidden from the general public. Members of the family knew about it. Some ministers knew about it. But uh, the general Russian public had no idea that he was ill with this disease. Um, another thing about his family life was that Nicholas II genuinely loved his wife, the Tsarina Alexandra. Theirs was a love match. In fact, uh, his father had not even wanted him to marry her, but he was insistent upon the marriage, refused to marry anyone else, and that was kind of a rarity at the time. Most royal marriages were arranged. You might get along with each other if you were lucky, but you were not usually in love with each other. That was the case, however, with Nicholas. He really did love and care for his wife. And as a result, he kind of, you know, I don't want to say let her get away with some things, but, you know, it definitely affected his decision making in terms of ruling the country. Some other key things happening in Russian society at the time 
was the freeing of the serfs in 1861 by Tsar Alexander II. He freed 23 million serfs. Now, serfs were basically unfree peasants, a little bit different from slaves in that they could not be sold separately from the land. They were tied directly to the land, but they had no rights or freedom to move around off of that land. They were stuck living where they were, uh, basically owned by the aristocrat or nobleman who owned that land. Now, when Tsar Alexander freed them, everything wasn't fine and dandy for them. They actually had to pay a sort of, I guess, a fee or a fine to their former owner in order to gain their freedom. And as a result, at least in the early years, they were often forced to sell off nearly all of the grain that they were producing just to pay this fee. Um, they were also often forced off the best land they had previously lived on and worked on, you know, the best land that these noblemen had. After being freed, they were often forced onto a much worse land where they still had to pay high rents. This land was often inadequate in terms of size and just its ability, uh, its, I guess, air ability, its the ability to grow crops there. And as a result, many of them actually ended up worse off than they had been when they were unfree serfs. Those who could not afford to pay the rent on this kind of inadequate land were forced off the land. They kind of became wandering peasants. As a result, there was very high unemployment uh, in the rural areas of Russia, and the peasant crop yield remained very low. They didn't grow nearly enough food to feed everybody, and there was massive famines, again, especially in the rural parts of Russia during this time. Some of these serfs uh, flocked to the cities where industrialization was finally starting to get going. Uh, as we learned about in one of the earlier units, though, industrialization and the urbanization that comes with that, all of these people suddenly crowding into these cities that really weren't uh, big enough to hold everybody, didn't have the housing or the resources needed to take care of all these people, that urbanization and industrialization often led to poor working and living conditions, as well as low wages for all of these people. So... These serfs, as well as the other people at the bottom of Russian society, didn't really end up any better off. They were often worse off than they had been before uh, the freeing of the serfs and industrialization. They also had to, I uh, forgot to mention, with industrialization, a lot of the large-scale industrialization projects were state-sponsored. They were uh, started by the Russian government in an effort to speed up this industrialization to help Russia catch up with the rest of Europe. Uh, an example of that was the Trans-Siberian Railway. Now, because the government was paying for and starting all of these industrialization projects, they needed money, so they would often uh, institute taxes to help pay for those, and those taxes often, the burden of those taxes most often fell heavily on these lower class people who were already struggling and already living in very poor conditions. Okay, in 1905, all of these issues kind of come to the forefront. They combine with the humiliating defeat of Russia in the Russo-Japanese War, which we had learned about in the previous unit. That was kind of a complete disaster for Russia, a shocking disaster. They had expected to win easily, and when they're decisively beaten by the Japanese, the first real Asian power to stand up to a European power, uh, it kind of sets off some protests, some strikes. Again, everything that had been under the surface with all these other issues kind of boils up and comes to the forefront. And there are strikes and protests uh, across Russia in, in major cities. Um, one of the major events of this sort of revolution of 1905, the first Russian revolution, was this event right here, Bloody Sunday. Now, every country, it seems, has their own event called Bloody Sunday. In Russia, that refers to uh, a event in which a group of peaceful protesters, thousands of peaceful protesters, were marching towards the Imperial Palace to present a petition to the Tsar. 
Now, they were led by that man you can see at the center of the picture. He's wearing a black robe and holding his hands up. He was a Russian Orthodox priest. I forget his exact name. It's not that important. But he had kind of gathered all these people together, and they were going to present a petition to the Tsar. It was not really an angry petition. It was a very uh, respectful petition that... I think referred to all of the protesters as the Tsar's children and asking him to institute reforms. Now, as they approached the palace, uh, generals, leaders of the military called out the Imperial Guard. The Tsar was not even present at the palace at the time, and exactly who issued the orders wasn't and still isn't clear, but the Imperial Guard was called out and fired on this crowd of protesters, killing several hundred of them and injuring thousands. It was a really shocking event. No one had expected uh, this to happen. No one thought that they would fire on, on that many unarmed civilians, especially in Russia, or I shouldn't say especially in Russia, even in Russia. Um, as repressive as it had been, this was a really shocking event, and it sets off a chain of even more strikes and protests across the country. Rather than crushing these protests like the generals and the leaders and the ministers no doubt thought, it actually sparks worse protests. There are mutinies within the Russian military. Uh, a most, the most famous one was a mutiny aboard a Russian battleship in the Black Sea Fleet called the Battleship Potemkin. It's kind of a famous event. There was a movie made after, uh, made about it, a uh, very famous movie. Some of you may have heard about it. Again, protests and strikes get even worse after Bloody Sunday, and this is generally referred to as the Revolution of 1905. Okay, now, at the height of the revolution of 1905, as these strikes and protests are spreading to every major city in Russia, the Tsar uh, actually even considers abdicating the throne. He strongly considers it. There are some uh, stories that he was on the verge of signing the document when he was convinced not to. Uh, but he does eventually kind of give in and reluctantly creates a new legislature. Uh, it tries to institute some government reforms, creating essentially a parliament known as the Duma. Now, the Duma was led by moderates. They did not want to do away with the Russian monarchy. Their goal was to create a constitutional monarchy very similar to what existed in Britain at the time. Um, the Tsar would have still had some powers, would have still been officially head of the military, but he would have been uh, much more limited. It would have been the end of you know, autocracy, in a sense. Uh, again, Nicholas had been forced to agree to this after all of these strikes and protests and the spreading of this revolution, and almost as soon as he creates the Duma, he regrets it. After just 10 weeks, he dissolves it when they start debating new measures that would have even more severely restricted his power. Again, he still very much wants to rule as an autocrat. He wants to be an absolute monarch. So he dissolves the Duma after just 10 weeks. He would later recreate it in a very, very weakened form. It would basically be a rubber stamp parliament, um, which would just, you know, sign off on whatever he had decided. But he did recreate it. It did exist in some form, but really played uh, no major role, at least uh, until the actual revolution of 1917 really got going. Now, the key with this revolution of 1905 is that it really foreshadowed 1917. Um, it was kind of a prelude to that. Things would obviously, as we'll learn, unfold a little bit differently with that, but it was the same sort of thing, discontent from below due to all of these issues and these failures to institute significant, meaningful reform kind of bubble to the surface. So this very much foreshadows what was coming in 1917. Now, after 1905, things do or did, I should say, stabilize for a little while. And that was mostly due to the efforts of this man, Pyotr Stilipin. He was the prime minister, basically the man put in charge by Nicholas II. Uh, and he did try to institute some reforms, mostly agrarian reforms, uh, 
Uh, for instance, he gave peasants the right to own private land. He also took some steps to try and modernize the Russian economy. Now, his reforms were not, I want to emphasize this, not intended to make Russia into a democracy. He actually wanted to strengthen the Russian monarchy, to strengthen autocracy. And he felt that the best way to do that was by modernizing the Russian economy, by bringing it more in line with the rest of Europe. And he did have some success with that. Again, there was some stabilization after the chaos of 1905. Unfortunately, he was assassinated in 1911, and with his assassination ended pretty much the last best hope of stabilizing things and preserving the Russian monarchy, at least in the form that it had existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. Okay, things really started to go downhill again, starting with the outbreak of World War I. In this little picture here, we have Tsar Nicholas II on the right and Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany on the left. They are wearing each other's uniforms. Nicholas is in a German uniform. Uh, Wilhelm is in a Russian cavalry uniform. Now, they were actually distant cousins, I think second cousins once or twice removed, as were most of the uh, ruling monarchs of Europe. Pretty much everyone was related to everybody in European royalty, uh, just kind of the way it works. But... An interesting fact about them. Now, Russia suffered over 9 million casualties in just three years of fighting, and those casualties included over 2 million dead. Obviously, that's a very high number, would cause a lot of problems. Now, after the initial failures, most notably the uh, defeat of the Russian army at the Battle of Tannenberg, Nicholas took personal command of the Russian army in 1915. Uh, he felt that taking command would give the public a face, a person, a figure to rally around uh, to unify the war effort. Unfortunately, he had no military experience whatsoever. Even though he was an autocrat, even though he was a czar used to making absolute decisions, and he was not a general, he had never fought, he was never a soldier, had no training whatsoever. And as the war continued to go poorly, instead of becoming a figure to rally around, a, you know, a face of a successful war effort, he actually became the face of those continued failures, resulting in him basically being a scapegoat for these 9 million casualties. When things didn't go well, all of Russia's anger became increasingly focused on him and his failure to lead them to victory. Other effects that World War I had on Russia were massive food shortages. Many uh, peasant farmers, many people in the rural areas of the country had been conscripted into the army, had been recruited, uh, drafted, I guess we'd call it now, into the army. The government was also taking lots of grain and other food that was being grown in those areas and sending it to the army on the front. As a result, there were uh, a significant lack of food and resources. You can see in this picture, this is a bread line, a bunch of, of people waiting in line just for a loaf of bread. The prices for food and fuel became wildly inflated. The price of pretty much everything skyrocketed. People couldn't get food. People couldn't get firewood to heat their and coal to heat their homes. Uh, major problems led to a lot of discontent on the home front. Now back in Petrograd, formerly known as St. Petersburg, which had had its name changed because it was decided that St. Petersburg sounded a bit too German, whereas Petrograd was a little more Russian sounding. Um, Nicholas II was away leading the Russian army at the front from 1915 to 1917. And he left his wife, the Tsarina Alexandra, back home in charge of pretty much all domestic affairs. Now, the problem with that was that she was strongly disliked by the Russian people. Uh, she had never really managed to win them over. They viewed her as being too German because she was German by birth, even though she had changed her name. She had never really made the effort that her mother-in-law and previous Tsarinas had made to really connect with the Russian people. 
uh, although they didn't know her son, Tsarevich Alexei, had hemophilia, they knew that he was sickly and rarely appeared in public, and they blamed her for the lack of a strong uh, and clear heir to the Russian throne. So in general, again, she did not get along with the uh, people of Russia, whether it's the nobles, whether it's the peasants, whether it's anybody. They didn't really like her very much. The other issue was, of course, that Alexandra had fallen under the influence of the quote-unquote holy man, Rasputin. Now, Grigory Rasputin is probably the most fascinating person involved in this whole time period in Russia. Now, he was born in Siberia. He was basically a Siberian peasant by birth, and he had wandered all around the country and, uh, according to some stories, even Eastern Europe, going as far as Greece, uh, working, or at least claiming to work as a healer and a mystic. He was also a notorious drunk who routinely asked for sexual favors from those he claimed to be helping. A, he had somehow managed to become acquainted with and talk his way into the kind of circle of the extended royal family. A few members of the royal family thought that he had, you know, helped them in some way. The details aren't exactly clear or important. Uh, but one of those members of the extended royal family introduced him to the Tsar and the Tsarina in 1905. Now, one of the reasons why he became so influential and managed to uh, work his way into the inner circle of the Russian royal family, the Romanovs, was that he seemed to have the ability to cure or at least treat the internal hemorrhages that the Tsarevich Alexei routinely suffered due to his hemophilia. And the Tsarina became increasingly convinced that he had some kind of magical powers or at least connection with God that was helping to protect her son. Now, the Tsar was not as enamored with him. He actually disliked him quite a bit. He had had the secret police look into Rasputin, and they drew up a report that told Nicholas all about his more disreputable and scandalous activities. Um, and the Tsar actually sent him away for a time, banished him from the palace. But then uh, a particularly bumpy and rough carriage ride had caused some internal hemorrhaging uh, in Alexei, and for several days he was on the verge of death. The Tsarina, panicking, sent a message to Rasputin asking him to return. Although he didn't return right away, he replied with a message telling her, God has seen your tears and heard your prayers. Fear not, the child will not die. And shortly thereafter, Alexei miraculously recovered. Um, it, some people claim that it was really just a change in attitude that, you know, everybody suddenly acting like he was going to get better helped him to rally. The exact reason why he was able to recover when being on the verge of death uh, is still not known, but it was certainly not to any due to any miraculous powers that Gregory Rasputin had. But Alexandra became convinced that it was, and she was even more under his spell, if you will, following that event. Uh, and after that, Nicholas felt that he couldn't send him away anymore, that he had to allow him into the palace again, because if he sent him away and then Alexei died, his wife would never forgive him, nor would he be able to forgive himself. He would always kind of think of himself as uh, the cause of his son's death if that happened. So Nicholas was kind of forced to keep him around. They gave him a job as a lamplighter in the palace just so that he had a legitimate reason to be there. But he kind of uh, really worked his way into the inner circle of the Romanov family. He was even eating dinner with the Tsar and the Tsarina and their family, their daughters and everything. Again, this is a peasant from Siberia, basically a con man who was known for a very scandalous per and, and disreputable personal life that even the Tsar knew about, and he's eating dinner with the Russian royal family. 
uh, really uh, fascinating and kind of shocking that that occurred. And it shocked people in Russia at the time as well. They became increasingly suspicious of the influence that he seemed to have over the royal family, particularly over the Tsarina, who with Nicholas away at the front was kind of running the country, at least running domestic affairs. Okay, so as Rasputin's influence continued to grow, it reached the point where the Tsarina Alexander was even allowing him to make political decisions. He was uh, dismissing and appointing ministers, making basically decisions at the highest level of Russian government. On that, again, just increased suspicion and eventually convinced a group of nobles that they had to act. Uh, those nobles were led by Prince Felix Yusupov. He was uh, distantly connected to the Russian royal family, and he was married to these, one of the Tsar's nieces. The, this group of nobles was probably also supported and encouraged by Russian, or not Russian, I should say, British intelligence. So British uh, spies, British uh, intelligence officers working with Russia towards the war effort at the time were probably encouraging this conspiracy of of the nobles. But on December 30th, 1916, they invited Rasputin to a dinner at Prince Yusupov's St. Petersburg mansion where they murdered him. Now, there are several stories about exactly what happened, some of them much more sensational than others and probably not true. But the traditional and sensational, most sensational story has them uh, attempt to poison him with him consuming like huge amounts of poisoned food that apparently had no effect on him. They then shot him several times and thought he was dead only for him to suddenly jump up and attack Prince Yusupov, who then stabbed him and beat him several times. They tied him up and tossed him in a frozen river, and when his body was recovered, it was discovered that he had in fact died of drowning. Uh, again, that's the most sensational version of his death. In reality, uh, they may have tried to poison him, but accidentally baked the poison off while they were cooking the food, um, and eventually killed him by shooting him in the head. There is a picture, then they recovered his body, there it was a clearly fatal gunshot wound to the head. Uh, so he probably died from that fairly quickly. Uh, and the more uh, elaborate versions of his death uh, were almost certainly not true, but kind of added to his mystique, to the legend of Rasputin, uh, which has existed, has continued to exist even to this day. Okay, now all of these events that we've just discussed uh, combined to lead to two major effects on Russian society at the time. Number one, there was a massive increase in social unrest, particularly in mass protests and worker strikes. As an example, uh, these protests and strikes increased between 1860 and 1905 from an average of just six per year to 176 per year. That's a huge increase, and that only got worse as the Russian involvement in World War I became increasingly unpopular, as those casualties continued to mount, and as supplies and food became increasingly scarce. Number two, this all caused there to be significantly less trust in the Tsar and the imperial government. Pretty much everybody who was not a member of the royal family, and even a few of those, nobles, politicians, lawyers, businessmen, intellectuals, workers, peasants, all of them began to lose faith in the Tsar's ability to govern Russia, at least to govern as an autocrat. Not all of them wanted to see him completely removed or wanted to see the complete end of the Russian monarchy, but they realized that he could not continue to rule as this autocrat. He didn't have it in him, and it might not be the best way for government to function. So again, there was an much, uh, in, uh, a great increase in uh, the lack of trust in the Tsar and his government during this time. And all of this helped lead directly to the Russian revolutions of 1917, which we'll talk about in the next lesson.